Well, thank you much, very much for the honor of being here tonight. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a disclaimer up front. It's like one of those warning labels. In the Central Intelligence Agency, all the record communication is carried out in written form. I mean, they got radios and television, and, I mean, telephones and stuff, right? But, but they send what they still call cables back and forth, and that's how you communicate officially. And there's this unofficial expression called cableese, which is the way you write. So it's this very stilted, overly polite form of writing. Think about some Englishmen in a stuffy British club in the late 1800s where everything is understated and indirect and nobody raises their voice. So the disclaimer is this, I was never any good at that. So somewhere in the bowels of headquarters are hundreds of messages back to me in the field, beginning with a statement to the effect of, thank you for your candor. You will understand in Kabelese, that's not what that means. That means you're a rude SOB, aren't you, Fattis? <laughs> but my intention is not to be rude, and I don't think I'll be rude to any of you, but I think we're talking about some very important matters and the hour is late, and the risk is very real, and the danger is grave. And so if there was a time to pull punches and dance around issues, it has long passed. So what I want to talk to you about is the Central Intelligence Agency, what has gone wrong, and what we need to do to fix it. I will begin with this additional statement. I wrote a book a number of years ago about the CIA called Beyond Repair, talking about what had happened to it. And I began with a disclaimer that said, nothing in the book should be interpreted as an attack on the men and women in the Central Intelligence Agency in the field doing the job, right? Everybody in Washington these days, as far as I can tell, talks in terms of being on the front lines of defending democracy. I'm not sure I even know exactly what that's supposed to mean in some cases. What I do know is this. The men and women of the CIA are way out in front of those front lines, deep in enemy territory every day. They do not do it for the pay, and they sure as heck don't do it for the recognition. They do it because they know, as I know, and I suspect everybody in this room knows, that there really are monsters out there, and somebody needs to be protecting us from them. We need the CIA, but we also need to recognize an uncomfortable reality. The CIA is not performing at the level we require. It is not keeping us safe. It must be repaired, and it must be repaired quickly. And let me illustrate what I'm talking about to take this from the abstract to the concrete with a few examples. The CIA was created after World War II with one overriding primary mission. This is why we built the thing, to prevent a reoccurrence of what happened on December 7th, 1941. We were never going to allow an enemy to surprise us on that scale ever again. We were never gonna find ourselves blind regarding a threat of that magnitude and immediacy. Before anything else, this was to be the job of the Central Intelligence Agency. It was to prevent another surprise attack. Then came September 11th, 2001. Members of Al-Qaeda hijacked four airliners. They crashed three of them into their intended targets. The fourth was prevented from reaching its target only by the heroism of the Americans on board. Al-Qaeda was not some unknown entity that materialized out of nowhere. It had been around for years. About every five minutes, bin Laden had been telling us it was his intention to attack us here, to attack what he called the far enemy. They had already blown up two of our embassies in East Africa. 
They had almost sunk the USS Cole in Yemen. They had already tried once before to take down the World Trade Center. And yet we had not a single source inside Al-Qaeda capable of warning us of the attack that would ultimately kill roughly 3,000 Americans. May 2nd, 2011, U.S. Special Operations personnel attacked a compound in Pakistan and killed the mastermind in the 9-11 attacks, Osama bin Laden. That operation in and of itself clearly a success. The fact that it took us almost 10 years after 9-11 to find and kill bin Laden is what should give us pause. Bin Laden understood the technical capabilities of American intelligence. After his escape from Afghanistan, he established himself in a compound with no internet service. He had no cell phone. He communicated with his organization via a courier system and dealt with those couriers face to face. There were no emails, text messages, or phone calls for us to intercept. That boils down to this. Finding bin Laden meant getting a source inside Al-Qaeda at a high enough level to know his physical location. It took almost a full decade for CIA with all of its resources to acquire such a source. Despite the fact that locating bin Laden was bar nothing else, the single top priority for the agency for that entire decade. Collection target number one, 10 years. COVID, bring this a little more recent. In 2020, we found ourselves in the midst of the so-called worldwide pandemic, which originated in China. Despite attempts to characterize this as a natural outbreak, That could be the FBI. <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds like them and it's consistent with their tradecraft, so. <laughs> we find ourselves in the middle of this pandemic and despite all this nonsense about this being a natural outbreak, it has become abundantly clear that COVID-19 came out of a lab in Wuhan, China was the product of gain-of-function research at that laboratory. It's also been clear for some time that there were many warning signs of the dangers of the work the Chinese were doing and the terrifyingly sloppy lab practices they utilized. Biological warfare threats are real, have been considered such for many years. Collection on both state and terrorist bio-warfare programs is one of CIA's top priorities. In fact, it is what's referred to as a tier zero priority, which means nothing takes precedence. The existence of the lab from which COVID emerged was not a secret. Neither was the fact that the Chinese were working overtime to make coronaviruses more dangerous to humans. And yet we received no warning prior to the outbreak of the pandemic. When people began to get sick here and around the world, CIA could apparently provide no useful information regarding the origins of the disease. And even now, years later, CIA seems unable to tell us precisely how the pandemic began. That boils down to this. We had no sources inside China's top bio lab and we apparently have no sources there now. So why? Why is an organization that is staffed with highly talented people and provided with resources that quite frankly are unparalleled anywhere else failing to perform? I'll give you two reasons and then consider them in succession. Bureaucratization and politicization. Let's begin with bureaucratization, or what somebody much cleverer than I has referred to as bureaucratic hardening of the arteries. 
CIA is in the business of espionage. So we forget for a moment all the gadgets and the technology and everything that Hollywood can imagine. The core business of CIA is recruiting spies inside target organizations, handling them securely, and producing intelligence for policymakers in Washington, D.C. At its heart, this is a very old business. As they say, the world's second oldest profession. And its essence has remained unchanged for thousands of years. This is not a science. It is an art. There is a reason intelligence officers talk in terms of tradecraft, because it is a craft. Not everybody can do it. Certainly not everybody wants to do it, because it can be a very, very hard business. A CIA case officer may be called upon to do many things in the course of his or her career, but when it comes down to it, his or her primary job is this, spotting, assessing, developing, and recruiting spies. That means getting close enough to some often very objectionable people to figure out what makes them tick, convincing them somehow to trust you, convincing them that you can keep them alive, and that they should help you by betraying their colleagues, their countries, their causes, all things in which they believe very deeply. That means getting a Russian intelligence officer to take actions he knows will result in his execution and the disgrace of his family if he's caught. That means persuading an Iranian nuclear scientist that working with you will actually make his countrymen safer and help create a better future for all Iranians. That means convincing a member of Al-Qaeda that you are not the enemy of Islam, that you know your trade well enough to keep him from ending up suffering a very grisly fate if he is discovered. So what does that require? It requires somebody with impeccable gut instincts that can make decisions very quickly, on the fly, navigate through this maze of mirrors, tolerate extremely high degrees of ambiguity because you hardly ever actually know anything for sure. When you are face to face with a dangerous person in a slum in South Asia or a desert in the Middle East, you do not have time to deliberate and you sure can't call Washington for advice because Washington's filled with bureaucrats and they have no idea what they're doing or what you should do. We have forgotten all of this. We have done our level best to turn CIA into just another federal agency. Recruiters no longer search for intangibles or focus on key psychological traits critical to success in the world of spying. They look at degrees, existing levels of language proficiency, and increasingly at things like the color of your skin and your sexual orientation. Training has, become, has been softened and become increasingly form book in nature. We act as if anybody can be taught to conduct espionage. We are now all fungible. This is no longer an arcane craft to be practiced by a select group of very unique people. You send somebody to training for a few months, they'll be fine. We have buried operations under endless layers of middle management. The fact that we can move large quantities of information over vast distances somehow now compels us to do so. So a case officer in the field may spend days writing up all the necessary paperwork to document a single asset meeting. Every moment they're doing that is a moment they are not out meeting sources, they are not recruiting new sources, they are not learning the environment around them. Back home, increasingly, the ranks of management are filled with individuals who have never demonstrated that they can accomplish anything on the street. In many cases, they will have only left Northern Virginia for a handful of short trips abroad. They have laughed at the boss's jokes. They have demonstrated their fealty to the prevailing groupthink. They have moved paper, attended meetings, and climbed the corporate ladder. In large measure, they have absolutely no idea how to run an operation or recruit a source. 